from the chicken slaughterhouse to the lights and the noise. You've not ever played with me. Have you not? Uh, he jumps, he's just for saying <laughs> 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 Right, Peter Crouch here. Uh, I'm with one of the biggest selling artists of all time, uh, Mr. Red Sheeran. Hello. Um, at your stadium gig in I, Zurich. I love this because you came as a guest and now we're doing the podcast. Oh, I've, I've been saying been... for ages we should do the podcast yeah. at, at the pub. But no. Yeah, well, listen, you know, you're a busy man. I get that. <laughs> um, so fitting in is difficult. You know what I'd like to do? Come to your pub. Well, that's what I thought we were going to do. Um, but I'm glad. I feel like this is more of a, this is a tester. This is lighting some scented candles well, is, and I'm... getting ready for the real event. You know your pub, what have you got in that? Have you got drafts and like draft beers and things like that in the bowl? I do, yeah. I think actually the thing that you all think's the coolest is uh, I bought two, um, like, you know when you go into like the tube or trains, they have those touch screens. Yeah. And I was like watching the Premier League, but like whilst watching having, having I follow for Ipswich games, and I was like, I wish I could have do you know the Sky scoreboard and mm. know when people are scoring goals or whatever. So I got two of those screens no, underneath the TV no. and they're touch screens and they just always have the um, league tables on, League One and, and Premier League. No way. So that's the, you'd, you'd like that. Mate, that's class. That's a good yeah. Saturday Because you kind of like, you'll watch a game and you'll be like, I wonder what happened in the other games and you just go, oh, just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god, that, that is class. So listen, we're in the, we're in the stadium now tour. I don't know if you know, but we've booked... Wembley Arena. I heard. Um, That's going to be for fun. For Crouch Fest. But will how it, does that work? Like, do, will you get heckled kind of thing and then you can talk back? Because it's a big place. Well, yeah, that happened last time. I don't know if you've ever played the O2 Indigo. That's where we had the last yeah. Crouch Fest. But we've just scaled up a little bit. Um, obviously, I did. I was here last last night. He did 40,000 people. So obviously, a man with a bit of expertise in this field. We have no clue what we're doing. Um, have you got any advice for me? Uh, I mean, it'll work. I know mm. all all that all I know about when you know ten thousand people plus come into one space together. All you need to do is kind of be somewhat entertaining, which mm. you guys are. So <laughs> as long as it's a good show, which it will be, I think like just involve them. Mm. Just, I mean, you know that from doing the Indigo. I think you'll be good. We should be all right. What um, I was thinking, obviously, you're playing a gig again tonight. I'm thinking like pre-match nerves. Like, what do you have a set routine, or and and also afterwards, like how do you sleep? I'm, I remember when I played like a Champions League game, and like the buzz and the adrenaline was so high that like, you, unfortunately, I'd have to have a few beers to go to sleep. Well, this is the thing. I always thought that that was like an excuse for like alcoholics, mm. like because all the musicians I knew were like mad alcoholics, and I always was like. Oh, I guess it's just an excuse that every, you know, they're just like, mm. oh, you know, drilling so big that I have to have like 40 beers afterwards. But really, it's just hiding that yeah, yeah. they just want 40 beers. But then I, when I, I, I went sober for a little bit and would do a gig and then just be like wired until like two o'clock in the morning, I actually felt um, exactly what you said. So mm. I, if I finish a gig, I'll have like half a bottle to a bottle of wine, just winding down, maybe like a steak or like a bit of chicken or something afterwards. It's interesting reading your books. Um, because it's exactly the same for me. There's a certain time you have to eat and don't eat anything mm. too funky. Yeah. As it just plain, because otherwise you eat and then you're jumping around on stage and you've got curry coming up in the back of your throat. And, you know, it's, it's, it's mad the similarities. There is, There's, there? you know, the fitness you have to have to be a footballer is like, if I play 10 minutes of football, I'm fucked. But mm. running around a stage and trying to be at all angles at all times. I found at the beginning of this tour, I really had to get into serious shape for it. I've never been yeah. an exerciser before. I've never like done weights. I've never gone on long runs. And training for this tour was pretty much like training for mm. a marathon. What is Ed Sheeran, the footballer, like? What position <laughs> would you play? <laughs> uh... Man, I don't know. I'm kind of like a bit of a headless chicken. I'll just run up and down. Yeah. I, I play football for fitness and fun. Like, yeah. I, So I'll go and all I want to do is really like have a kick around, but have a big run yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, and come off it and be like, okay, that was good. Yeah. But, but me, my, my wife for her birthday every year does a, a football, we have a football pitch at our house. She does a football tournament because she was in the year below me at school and I was in the year above and we sort of have a superiority thing of like year below, year above. And it's all of her mates versus all, all of ours. We, we won the first one. She won this year. 
Just. Really? Just, Ted yeah. Skaza. Just. Oh, it's pretty... oh, people like lo locals, you. It's all about schoolmates, yeah. yeah all about, I mean, because we, because we were in the same friendship group, there was no like, oh, you have to meet my new friends or you meet, we just mm. like sort of started dating and all of our friends were still our friends. It was, it was actually very convenient. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're still good pals with all your pals from school? And... They're pretty much my, they're really? my pals. Yeah, they're yeah. my pals. And everyone's sort of slowly, I moved back to the area in 2012 mm. and ever, people are slowly moving back now. So it started sort of becoming the community it was when we were 15. Again, yeah, it's yeah, nice. Yeah. And what's the Ipswich thing? Obviously, listen, I, I had three months on loan at Norwich, so I don't, I don't know why I'm sitting next to it, but... Um, yeah, but you've you've been to... Like, your loyalties I've, aren't with Norwich, I've right? been everywhere. Who would your loyalties be with... Is it... Difficult one, obviously, like I say, I've played so many... Because all the Liverpool fans on my crew are very excited that yeah. you're here. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a real good affection with Liverpool fans, and, like, I'd say that was probably the best... Because it was such a big club, and like, we were playing Champions League football. We, yeah. you know, we were we were competing at the top level, and I was probably in the form of my life. It took me a while to score, but then once I did, I was I was you know I was off and running, and I was playing for England. I was scoring goals. That was the most confident I've ever been. So that's probably the biggest sort of relationship. And wherever I go, when I go back to Liverpool, it's so nice to you know everyone's you know kind to me. Whatever, it's, it's a good place to go back. My wife's from there, and I've got ties there. Totally. But yeah, but like all of them, you know, Tottenham QPR obviously I started there. Southampton projected me, you know, it was. It's cool, really, because you can kind of go anywhere, and there'll be fans of all those clubs that sort of see you as one of their own. Exactly know? right. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice That's feeling. Cool. But no, how... the, the Ipswich thing was, um, I basically like I was a, like Ipswich when I was a kid. It was all encompassing when. I mean, it's the local team. Mm. And then I sort of moved away and not just lost interest in football, but I lost interest in everything. Like, I, I remember, uh, like, the in-betweeners is my generation. Mm. So, like, all of my friends love the in-betweeners. And I remember, like, eight years ago discovering it. I think when, I think when the movie came out, it was 2011, like 10, 10 uh, 11 years ago. And when it came out, and me being like, how did I miss this? Like, I, <laughs> well, you didn't watch the series before, I didn't watch, I didn't watch TV. I, I moved to London and I was doing shows every night of the mm. week. And then in the day I was in, in the studio. So I just lost interest in everything. I didn't read any books, didn't really, I didn't really listen to any new music. I was just, just focusing on my stuff. And then when it got big, I guess I was so focused on keeping it big that it wasn't until things sort of settled down a bit that mm. I rediscovered things. And I moved back mm. to Suffolk and was like, oh yeah, like I loved Ipswich as a kid. The stadium's 30 minutes away from my house, so I just started going to games. I just want to touch on, obviously, like last night, you mentioned on stage that you closed your eyes, I think it was the A-team song, yeah. and you closed your eyes and, you know, remember you were playing to like two, three people and then, you know, open them again. I've played that song to just the sound engineer before. Like, really? like no one's, I remember I played in, in, no, it wasn't Swindon, Exeter, and I got down and I bought a train and the train was more than the fee for the gig. So I was like, because mm. the fee for the gig was, say, it was 50 pounds. The train was like 60. And I was like, I should be able to sell some CDs down here and like make my money back. And I got, I got there. Remember, it was just like the barman who was in the other room and then the sound guy running. And I was just outside, you know, my name was on the poster and I was sitting, I was playing Pokemon at the time on the, the, the Game Boy, just sort of like waiting. And my set time was eight. And I went in, no one was there. And I said to the sound guy, I was like, can I wait a bit? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I wait till 8.30. No one came. Nine, no. nine, 9.30, 10. And then he was like, come on, man. Like, I've got to go. <laughs> so I played to just him. And then I missed, I missed the last train. No way. So I was just sat at the train station all night playing Pokemon, waiting for the first train to come in. Came in at like six and then went back to London. But I remember on that train back, I'm like, why? Like, why am I still... Try, trying this it was like a really like that happened a few times in succession of just you think you're getting the first spark of something and then that just happens and it reminds you that like it's not happening and then I don't know there was just a switch in I think it was uh, I mean my record company will hate me saying this but I think they admit it too but it was uh, illegal downloads like really helped my career really? because yeah because I would I basically gave up on trying to be signed by a record company and I just put out these EPs and I put them out on a uh, a, a site called TuneCore and it charged you like $20 and you'd put it up and it would put it on iTunes and and all of these things but then all the university students would there'd be like one person goes to university brings it and then they just burn it 
and just file share it to to everyone. The plus, I think, was I think it might still hold the record, but my debut album was like the most illegally downloaded album <laughs> that really? year. And uh, I I remember being super excited. My record company being like, oh, "This is the worst thing in the world." And I remember being super excited, being like, "Oh, that means I get to like tour like big venues because like everyone has the album," which is ex exactly what it meant. Um, but yeah, fi like file sharing and illegal downloads uh, really helped me. And so there was a momentum that was um, built from giving up trying to get signed and just putting out music that like snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and then like within the course of a year went from Exeter, no one coming to like just university students and real like geezers as well. Like I know my fan base is very, um, mm. swings very female now, but it was real like lads would come to these gigs mm. and then I got signed and then everything happened. So um, yeah, it's, things can change. I mean, I'm sure you have had that in the phase of when you were younger before getting signed to, a, you know, a youth club, mm. like there's a lot of disappointment oh, and missed God. opportunities. The knockbacks are constant, yeah. you know, like the constant people telling you all the time that you're not good enough, you know, so to, it's like to but have you're probably, that But you probably weren't and I probably wasn't. Yeah. But the thing is, if you have someone saying you're, you're not good, rather than you're not good enough, you're not good, you start being like, you know, your the inner belief does, mm. does does go down, but there has to be some part of you that goes. But I can get better. I can get better. Mm. So if it's not you're not good enough, you just keep working it, keep working it, keep working it. But, but it's yeah, it like I mean, music and football uh, two very. I think I do think this is why we we really get on as well. But they're two very similar um, professions in the sense of if you go into any primary school mm. anywhere in the world and you say, "What do you want to be?" It's usually to a, a lad but mm. and you know now after the the lionesses mm. that will be Lots like huge but you say to pretty much anyone what do you want to be and it's either like a footballer or a yeah. something to do in music, music pop yeah. star you know without doubt so one of our listeners i don't uh is a lad called joel and uh, i don't know if you know mike dean retired recently the referee mike dean yeah um I so, keep thinking there's a there's a um, uh, engineer called Mike Dean as well. It? Yeah, yeah. You got about hundred mics on this tour. Dave's, no, we got Dave's. Dave's yeah, Dave's, we got, Dave's. well, actually, we haven't got as many Dave's now. We had we had yeah, Chalky Dribble and Normal Dave. No, but I can't believe it's called Normal Dave. Like, well, because the other two are called Chalky and Dribble. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've got to play you this song that Joel wrote for our podcast. I don't know if you know. So Mike Dean's a bit of a, a legend on our pod, and. Um, he used to work in a chicken slaughterhouse. My mates worked in a turkey slaughterhouse. They, they, <laughs> no, it's yeah. screw him, isn't it? I, when we speak to Mike Dean, he's, he's kills like, the, the factory kills about 160,000 chickens a day. <laughs> <laughs> some, some chick is unbelievable. But anyway, nice. um, I just want your, uh, I want your thoughts on this, on this okay. song. This is Joel, one of our listeners. <laughs> yeah, be very pleased that you're listening to this. of a boy from the chicken slaughterhouse to the lights and the noise the FA Cup final and European games oh my never changed with them all the same oh and where will we be Without you on our TV screens The most card friendly we've ever seen It's Mike Dean Mike Dean, Mike Dean The funniest ref we've ever seen Great man, what I love reckon? it. Yeah, I really like it. It's what? Good. I really thought he was gonna go. Because mm -hmm. you got an E rhyme there. Yeah. Mike Dean, Mike Dean, the referee, and then yeah. you have that bit. So yeah, that would be if I was given a note, I would go. You know, put the Mike Dean the referee in, and then you have the the big singer. 
But it's fucking great. I love it. He's got a great voice as well. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, really cool. He sang that for his. Um, we did a. We did a little. You got to get him up at Wembley then. We'll, we'll get him up definitely. So uh, we'll, we'll, I remember we'll make the that first little tweak. I played. I played Wembley for a girl. Guides gig, like one of the, it was like me, Rizzle Kicks, and I think Pixie Lot or something. It's like way back in the day. And I remember tweeting, I'm playing Wembley today. And someone tweeted back, went, Yeah, Arena, not staying with dickhead. <laughs> we had that the other Times change. <laughs> Times change. <laughs> <laughs> Wembley Stadium now, yeah? But you played Wembley as I well. Have. How many times have you played Wembley? I bet you played Wembley more than I have. Um, do you know what? Because I played when it was getting built. So uh, we were at Old Trafford a lot. So I got there just under Fabio Capello. The last game I ever played at Wembley was England-France and I scored. I've never, never been back since. It's got, I mean, but that's a, good, that's a good out. Yeah. Scoring at Wembley. It's going to yeah. be amazing. I read both your books. My first daughter, like, refused to sleep in a buggy. So mm. what I used to do is walk around the house with her in my arm like that with a Kindle. And I'd just walk around and around and around until she got to sleep and then I'd keep her asleep. And I read, like, both your books. My favourite... Your books are so funny, but it's so <laughs> funny hearing you talk about things... Like with the, you know, the, the Fabio Capello thing, like mm. you just never learn English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. you know, now you think about it, like you were coaching the English national team and But crazy. I feel like, yeah, he, I mean, he came over and uh, it, it felt like he didn't really inv invest in it. Like he'd For won sure. everything and he was older. And I don't know how much he was, you know, he wanted to be there, if I'm honest. And uh, It's funny what you say about all the um, sort of Italian and Spanish players that come over and they're just like, what is this food? Because whenever <laughs> whenever Americans come to London, I'm always like encouraging them to like not just go to the standard places they would go to that exist in like New, New York. And it all, like Cardi B refuses to eat in England now. Really? Okay, I, I sent her to a chicken place. But the thing is, she got takeaway rather than eating there. And she's just uh. like, English food's so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, a lot of the foreign players don't think our food is atrocious. If you think about it, though, like, I mean, I love our food, but if you think about it in terms of, like, pie mash, <laughs> you know, sausage mash. I was going around today, we've been in we've been in Munich for a week and now we've been in Switzerland for a week and then we go to um, Frankfurt next week. And I'm trying to eat local as much as possible and it's literally you go in and they're like, I'm like, what, what do you have? They're like, well, we, we have pork shoulder, pork belly, uh, pork knuckle. And, uh, and I'm like, do you have any, anything else? They're like, yeah, yeah, we have sausage. And I'm like, okay, okay. okay. And then we have uh, baked potato, fried potato, boiled potato, and uh, roshti, which is basically like boiled potato and fried potato and beer. <laughs> but there's lots of different types of beer. We've got 25 cent a litre beer, 50 cent a litre beer, and a litre beer. Or a bottle beer. <laughs> I feel fucking grim at the moment. Like every, <sighs> every day. It's just the same. <laughs> beer me no, I, because I want to, because I'm here. I, I don't want to go to, I don't want to eat like a bolognese in mm. Zurich, you know? I want to I eat local food, but mm. also it's fucking heavy. Yeah. But how, how much do you see it? Like, I remember when, if I'm playing sort of it, with England or we were playing away in Europe and, or we'd never really see But that's city. because you're on your own with the lads and that, that was me on the last tour is you I wake up you're fucked from the gig you've probably gone out and have a few too many mm. beers anyway so you're just going to lie in put TV on Netflix or whatever maybe go out in the evening have a nice meal but having kids on tour like revolutionises it to a point that like it's unfair to keep a kid in a hotel room beyond 9am mm. so you're up and then you're like, you have breakfast you get ready and then you're like right we're out and we've been to so many zoos on this tour yeah. we've been, we went to Zurich Botanical Gardens today. It's just like things to get them out. That's it. They're interesting. That will knacker them to give them time mm. to nap, basically. And that's it's good because it's, it's such an excuse to th see things in a city. But your your job is obviously like evening, right? So your your people's entertainment in the evening. It's a weird sort of time, similar to mine. Like when everyone's off, I'm working yeah. or was. Um, how how do you find that balance of going big in the evening, coming off stage? 50,000 screaming fans. And having to catch up with your mates. And then are... going back. Does your missus just change the subject straight away? That's what Ab used to do. Firstly, on the tour, it's kind of, we sort of flip-flop a little bit because we can put the kids down before the gig. But then after the show, I usually get off. I usually get off and I have like half an hour with like a bottle of wine and a bit of food and maybe like my mate Nick, maybe Cherry, maybe, but not like a lot of people. And then there's usually like a room where everyone hangs like tonight mm. my, actually my room is becoming that tonight so oh, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll all have a drink with that tonight but 
Well, we were in here last night, to be honest, till quite late. But you don't want to be, but you don't want to be, um, as you said, you don't want to be talking about it straight away, especially if you've had a bad gig or a bad game. You don't want to suddenly just be talking about it. But mm. yeah. Is there bad gigs? Have you had like... Totally, yeah. Actually, for me, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not that musical. So I maybe would uh, you would do things and like, I wouldn't spot it. Do you know what I mean? Like you... Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, like, gigs are such routine, especially, like, with the size of the shows. There's, like, certain points you have to hit to build a crowd up and be like, okay, if we nail this, and that's going to be like, if we nail this. And if one of them fucks up, it's kind of like dominoes. So I'll get, like, my show relies on this loop pedal. And if the pedal fucks up on song two, Mm. song three, I'm like, oh, I hope it doesn't fuck up on this mm-hmm. song. And then it just like, it, it gets in your head. Or the first Wembley I walked out, started strumming and the microphone wasn't on. And I was like, no. But what do I do? And that's, that's the first song. First song of the first five, five, five Wembleys. The microphone shut off. My um, ears, which are basically the, the monitors mm-hmm. so I can hear stuff, that shuts off. So I was like thinking on my feet and A-Team is the, you know, the most well, well-known song of the first five songs. So I just take that and put that first and play 18 without any in-ear monitors because it's acoustic. And so that sort of works and you can yeah. kind of think on your feet. But then after that, you're like, well, what else is going to fuck up? And what, it's such a, the, the 72 tons of steel above me. Mm. And that like was coming down one day and just froze. And then suddenly like, you can't use the fireworks you're going to do on the last song. So it's, it's it, the, if some of the um, uh, routine bits don't work, it can get in your head and the gig ends up being actually quite bad. When I started the tour, I was like, look, lads, undoubtedly things are going to fuck up. Mm. The stage is there. I mean, you look at the stage and you just go, oh, it's in in the round and and blah, blah, blah. But the amount of work that goes into keeping, like building that thing, keeping it running, having all the stuff underneath it, like just having it in the middle where you can't have like generators out the back. When it's, when you have a stage at the end, all the shit is behind the stage. Mm. You've got all the video people there and blah, blah, blah. Ha- having it in the middle and having nothing, it creates a lot of difficulty for uh, everyone working with it. So things do go wrong. So at the beginning of the tour, I was like, I understand if things go wrong on this leg of the tour, but they can't go wrong on the next leg of the tour. Mm. So like work out all your things now. Yeah, and yeah. like if... If the screens fuck up, we work out why it fucks up, we fix it, and then it won't happen again. And if the revolve fucks up, we work out. And all of these things are fucked up and all of them be fixed and they haven't happened again. But if they do happen again, that's when I will get angry. Because mm. that will be there will be that will be a mistake rather than just things fuck up. Yeah. England's chances. We've got Crouchfest is uh it's the 19th of November. I think it's two days before the World Cup kicks off. So we're gonna we have a big party. How do you think of England's chances? Like I think the heat's gonna fuck them. It's yeah. hot out there. It's like 50 fucking degrees. Mm. But do I guess if they're training there for like ages, but you uh, like, how do you find playing in heat? No, I hated it. I hated it. It was, I remember playing in Houston once in a preseason friendly and um, it was so dry and the hottest stuff. It was, you know, when you like, you walk out and it feels like you've just walked into a sauna or an yeah. oven or something. It was ridiculous. Without a doubt, definitely quarters. Mm. I hope, so. like I would, I would love to see a final again. Did you go to the last one the, in uh, the Euros? So I bought the Euro final ticket when it was announced and I was like, whoever plays, I'll go. So mm. I bought it and then COVID happened and it was postponed. So I had my final ticket. And so when England were doing well, I was like, this is fucking cool. And then they were in the semi-final and the guy that owns my record company was like, I, I got a box for the semi-final. Do you want to come? And I was like, yeah, great. Mm. And I went and I got covid no. And I missed the final. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I know, but I gave... Um, to be honest, it wasn't a good experience. I, gave, I went. I gave my tickets to my best mate and his dad and then got two more for his sister and the, their boyfriend and they had the time of their life, even though it wasn't the yeah. result. that. So I sort of feel like I got to see a semi... I went to a few games as well. Mm-hmm. I got to see a, a semi-final and blah, blah, blah. But I just found it ironic that the one game that I'd actually bought tickets to, mm-hmm. I didn't... I didn't, didn't go to. Yeah. In my pub, actually, me and my wife put on our England shirts. Got, I was like, "What do you drink in England shirts?" We got like forty Stellas and just, <laughs> just went, went for That's it. pretty much what we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you ever had a, a low? Um, this is half a lager and half a stout. It's our drink that we made up on the pod. Dave and uh, and Chris obviously would would love to meet you as well. And um, I think you'd outshine a him few anyway, louts you know. in your in your pub would. Would well, I get, I've got, I've basically, I've got uh, Kingfisher, Stella, Guinness, 
and oh, the local. I always thought when I was I was thinking about like what I should do that isn't music for fun, and I thought like ginger beer or sun cream. Because you would buy sun cream if my face was on. He'd be, like, <laughs> he'd be like, he definitely knows he what knows he's talking what... about. <laughs> you would though, wouldn't That's you? a good one. Like if you're going to a hot country and you yeah. need a factor 70, you'd be like, yeah. who do you reckon uses factor 70? Yeah, uh, yeah that's fair. <laughs> but yeah, I'll bring, I'll bring a load of uh, loots down if you're on others. Pub quiz maybe. I'm in, yeah. My brother is the best pub quizzer, but he just can't do popular culture. So me and him are like, he can do all the what's the capital of this? And like in 1827, who did this, this, this? Mm. But he wouldn't be able to tell you like who won Love Island last year. <laughs> well, that sounds perfect. Uh, Dave, Chris, we are uh, going to the pub um, just during the World Cup, watch a game and we're doing a pub quiz. Well, I know. I also have, I, I got a giant uh, neon Ipswich sign made for my pub. It's fucking huge. Really? Yeah. Like a neon. And when I, when, I, when I saw it, I was like, I bet even Ipswich don't have one of these. And that is just, it's massive. Did you ever play Ipswich? Uh, do you know what? I, I don't think I've played against Ipswich, but I don't think I've ever been to Portman Road. I don't know why that has happened. I just, I don't think I, don't think I played there. No. Bizarrely. I really, really hope it, I mean, it will do a lot for the town if we get yeah, promoted. Yeah, yeah. And I th yeah. I just think if we got in the Premiership, it'd be fucking mad having like Man City <laughs> coming to yeah, play yeah, at Portman yeah. Road. But that's the thing is that even now, like we see like teams that go up, it's it's it's. I love that just... uh, Nottingham Forest went up. That, yeah. that that was that was one that made me really chuffed. It's a proper and club. I feel like I feel like that's going to happen more now. I feel like the 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 big teams because. I mean, this is what like annoys me so much sometimes about my friends who are big fans of the, the big teams and they always see themselves as the underdog. And I'm like, you're owned by a fucking billionaire. Like, <laughs> shut up. You, you have all the same advantages that all the other teams have. Mm. You just have really, really poor management and poor people running mm. it. And you are not buying the right players. But they're not under... Like, no one out of that fuck top league of like six teams, mm. they're not underdogs. Mm. They're all... They all have the opportunity to be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they... Yeah. Do you agree? It, no, to totally. I think like the way obviously Man City are on a different different stratosphere with with financially, but yeah. But I feel like the other teams are as well. They just don't use it. Like the the I'd say the people that own Chelsea have the ability mm. to buy people like Erling Haaland. And well, they've, stuff proved, like, they've yeah. proven it. They've proven it. I mean, they've, they've spent millions, millions. Um, they just I don't know if they've got the blend right, like City have and Liverpool. No, to but be fair to Liverpool, but that's, spent a... but that's my point. It's not about. Man City, the riches. Of course, Man City have a lot of money, but they have a great manager and mm. a great team of people. Yeah, mm. so that's that's what people need to sort out, rather than mm. just being like we're the we're the underdog. Because the real underdog is like <laughs> these guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like we're we're trying. Mm. No, I, I agree with that totally as well. Now, people always you can always cry at home. Everyone in the Premier League gets fortunes to be there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and like just spend it more wisely. People spend so much money on. On, on, on so many players that aren't good enough or don't get the manager right or don't get the infrastructure behind the manager right. Did you ever get players brought in when you were playing at all these top clubs that you were like, you cost a bit too much and oh you're not worth God, it? Oh my God, I mean, players are so ruthless. I remember being at, at Liverpool, I've talked about it before, like Carragher and Gerrard, like players oh, walk, mate, through the yeah. draw, walk through the draw <laughs> and like, they would cost 20 million and they'd be written off in the first train session. You know, cut one bad session, it was like, he's crap. <laughs> Why he did our money? Wow. <laughs> Ruthless. But you know what? When do you think Gerard's going to end up being Liverpool manager? Um, or do you think he's got like 10 more years of... No, no I don't think 10 more years. I think, you know, I think he's got a, he's got to do his apprenticeship, if you like. I think he's, you know, he's, Klopp's got that job for as long as he wants it. And then as soon as he leaves, I think Stevie needs to just be in the right position, like doing well, sort of, so his stock's high and then, you know, it'd be, it'd be a no-brainer, I imagine. Was he alpha of the dressing room then? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. the local lads as well, like, what a player, you know? So for me, I, I found myself trying to impress Stevie more than I was man the manager, <laughs> <laughs> which honestly, which is a mad way of looking at it, but that's, that's how it was. What's the best gig you've done? Me and Stormzy have had two number one singles and until this year had never performed them live because we released them just before mm. a pandemic, his tour got cancelled and, and blah, blah, blah. And bringing him out, I went, I, he brought me out of his gig at the O2 in 
March or April. Mm. And that was the first time we played Take Me Back to London and Own It. But mm. playing Take Me Back to London with him at Wembley Stadium, it was like the last night of our run of five gigs there. And like, I've never felt a crowd like that before. Mm. It was just like, just the most electric. Like he walked off stage and was like, that's the best really? thing that's ever. Yeah, like both of us were like, that's our best crowd moment of all time. I mean, it was insane insane but we have like it's kind of like a, a crossover fan base and also like those songs are like take me back to london was on my project own it was on his project so doing them like one after the other with ninety-two thousand people there for the same it was like really mm, special special and because the stage is in the center you the the energy is completely different it's not you don't just get energy this way it's like all around mm -hmm. it's 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 really cool I always try and put on my best show for people that have come to the gigs, but when there's someone who you like love and respect mm. to turn up, there's a bit of like a, not peacocking, but you're like, mm. I'm going to really I put it into the air. Who's, so. who's, who's been that for you? Who have you had at your gigs where you've gone actually, I need to turn it on? Uh, I th the first one I remember clearly would have been playing in Brooklyn and Jay-Z and Beyonce coming and getting it in my in-ear monitor, just being like, yeah, Jay-Z and Beyonce just walked in and just being like... <laughs> Okay. Would you rather have not known that? <laughs> no, or, no, because uh, it does bring out a certain... There's a... Like, any any artist will tell you that. It brings mm. out a certain thing. But yeah. but yeah. Do you know them? Would you class them as friends? Well, yeah, I did this. Yeah. I've done I've done uh, Perfect with um, Beyonce and almost Take Me Back to London with Jay-Z and mm. Stormzy. It was one of those ones mm. where I was like... I had the song and I'd sent it to Jay-Z... And he was, he actually emailed me back being like, do you not think Stormzy would go on this? And I was like, yeah, that'd be a great idea. And instead of doing the thing of, it happens so much in music where everything's just send you an MP3 and then you send your vocals back and blah, blah, blah. I was like, I would love it to be a moment of all of us in the same room together. Um, so we just waited and then we were all playing the same festival in South Africa. So I just messaged Jay and was like, can we sort of studio out. I flew Fred out who'd produced the song and it was like a room full of just amazing people. And uh, yeah, the song didn't end up happening, but what did happen was Jay-Z and Stormzy met and shared this like incredible conversation that actually was and ended up being the beginning of uh, Stormzy's Glastonbury set. And I was uh, like, from the camera, I was sitting behind it just watching this thing happen. So I think for me, that was more important than the song happening. Mm. But... But yeah, so I do know, I kind of know everyone sort of just mm. like you would sort of know every footballer, but everyone has their own friends and everyone has their own family unit. And that's what people put their time in. Like I'm not, it's great fun hanging out with celebrities mm. and it's great fun going to like random dinners or award shows and stuff. But I would much rather be at home putting time into the people I see every day. Like mm. every now and then me and Cherry will be like, right, let's go to London and have dinner with this person. But it's mm. not like an every night thing mm. you know we see you maybe four times a year yeah. and it's all and it's always a great night but mm. you've got your kids you've got your friends we've got our kids we've got our friends and i think that's more otherwise it's just this vacuous thing of just like i can imagine living in los angeles being out for dinner every night mm. with like this person and this person it's not and this real person. is it well you'd never form proper relationships you just go oh i had a cool dinner once with like I went for sushi once with the the Edge from mm. U2, and I remember that was a great night. I'm mm. like, that's a great memory. But again, he's got his own friends and family that he's mm. going to put his time. In. So, yeah, you'd never form true yeah. relationships like like you would with your first day one mm. mates and your wife and blah blah blah. Yeah, because I just think for you, it's just it's just gone so global now. Like you must get recognised absolutely everywhere. It must be difficult for you. I mean, listen, I'll get, I'll get recognised, but I think if you globally... Oh, well, no, you're, mate, you're like, we're both the same, I think. Well, I think you you will stick out from any crowd and I will yeah, stick so out from, <laughs> from... I think we both do, to yeah, be fair. Yeah, to totally. You but know, it's, like, it's like quite recognisable, you know, my height, obviously, you know. And I think the, the, the difficulties that you'll face as well, as well as doing the, the podcast, is you're known as a really nice... <laughs> bloke who's friendly mm. so like at any point of the day even if you're having the worst day of and your kids are screaming at you yeah. and abby's pissed off at you yeah. and someone hey man yeah. you have to be like yeah cool yeah <laughs> yeah having a great day how are you you know because because you are 
Peter Crouch, the lovely man who has the podcast that everyone listens to and, um, and blah, blah, blah. So it's less of like, sometimes celebrities, there's this like veil of like mystique. And, mm. you know, sometimes you would see them out. Like I remember being at a restaurant and seeing like Madonna there. And it's like, it's mm. you know, like there's like a mystique. Whereas if I was at a restaurant and I saw like, I don't know, like Jamie Redknapp. Mm. I'd be like, I'm gonna go. I, I do know Jamie, but mm. there's the you see him on TV and he's he's friendly, and you would just go over to him and mm. say hi, you know. That's it. I, I mean, that's that's what I get. But I think that's comes with you as well. I think it must totally, be like yeah. the same as totally, you. But so. it's, I don't go out a hell of a lot, and we live in our um, the town that we grew up in, where we know everyone. So if I wow. go out, the people working in the pub. I went to school with the people who work in the supermarket. I went to school with, like, I I know everyone. So there's not really, um, yeah. If I'm in London, I just don't go out in London. Really? really. Yeah. Would you like to be able to go out a bit more and not? Yeah. Really? Well, I mean, it's kind of been norm. It's been normality for me for about 13 years of not being able to do that. Do you know to a point where like. You know, I wasn't as famous as I was 13 years ago as I am now, but it's I was still like go places and people mm. would, you know, photos or whatever. So it has been sort of nor normality and I'm fine with it because if I go out, it's my personal choice that I've accepted that that's going to happen for the evening. Mm. So if I, sometimes I'll go like out, out with my friends and in my head, like I'm going to Ibiza to shoot a music video next week. And in my head, I'm like, I'm just going to go have fun and whoever wants a picture can have a mm. picture and that's not going to like affect anything. Mm. Like, and I'll know that people will be filming me taking mm. shots and if I throw up, I throw up. You know, like, <laughs> and it's just that, and that, that's just going to be that. But it's when you go to something and you have a different idea of it in your mind where, you know, like I go to the park with my daughter and all I want, I'm in my mind, I'm like, I just want to like push her on a swing. That's mm. all I want to do. And then you have, like I was at the park the other day, man, and she'd like, my daughter had had this like, it was late, she'd had a tantrum. I'd left my keys in the house. I was locked out of the house. I was like, fuck it, I'll take her to the park. I bought some pasta on the way. And I was just sitting down with her, just me and her, and I was feeding her pasta. And there were all these parents there, like kind of looking. And I'm uh, one of them came up and was like, sorry, can we have a photo? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be a dad. I'm just trying to feed feed my daughter. And this 10-year-old kid comes up on a bike, goes, Oh, are you at Sharon? And I went, bro, like, come on, like. I'm clearly like feeding my two-year-old mm. daughter. Please, I'm like, man, it's really nice to meet you, man. But please, just like, my daughter's like, she needs to have a sleep and she needs to have food and blah blah blah. Just please let me feed her. But it's really nice to meet you. And he just rides around the bike on his uh, park on his bike, screaming out, "Hey, Sharon, is over there!" Hey, oh, Shira. that's the. And I'm there, just like <gasps> I'm like, and and now that's like unsafe for my daughter yeah, as well. And it's just yeah, like yeah. I find it the being a parent uh, and like. My time of going to the park to push my daughter on the swing used to be like 7 p.m. when it was dark and no one was there. And I remember just being like, this is fucking depressing. So mm. I just started going in the day and not really giving a fuck what, what happened and asking people not to film. But it's a, it's a really weird... Um, people don't really see, unless you snap them out of the reality of it, they don't really see you as a parent. They just see you as the... And then when you say, I'm actually just trying to be a dad today, they go, oh, of course. And when you say, please don't film my kids, they go, oh yeah, of course. Like, I wouldn't want you filming my kids. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of, they, there's you, you have to just sort of snap people back into reality a little bit. And I'm trying, I'm really, really trying to be a normal, I don't want my daughter to just grow up in this like abnormal world where all she does is hang out with famous people mm. and go to like really expensive private schools and just hang out with really rich, but I don't want that. Like, I, that's not, not how I grew up and I don't want her to grow up like that. But at the same time, like, there's, a sort of societal push in that direction. And I'm really, really trying not to do it. Like, I don't want to go to, like, exclusive parks that mm. only fucking billionaires go. I want to just go to the local park and push her and she mm. plays with all the local kids, you know. But anyway. Let's talk about England songs, right? World in Motion, for me, was the best of all time, I think. Be better than three. I, I believe on, so. Man. Like, you, like, I know, you like Three Lions, man. I love Three Lions. Three well, Lions is our national emotion. anthem. Three Lions is our national anthem. Yeah, but it, is. it also doesn't have a John Barnes rap. So that <laughs> that is that is the one thing of that song that people talk about. So really, you have to say the best part of any song is John Barnes' is rap, which I would probably agree with. But like, Three Lions, no is one, epic. no one talks, no one talks about uh, World in Motion or sings it the same way they sing Three Lines. But everyone True. knows John Barnes' rap. So John Barnes. 
superior to all of that and the rap superior, but the song... No, but nah, I think man, if you it's, all, listen, it's all about three lines. If you had to listen to one, one of those songs for the rest of your life once a day... Well, I mean, we listened to that pretty much every day of the summer last year, didn't we? I mean, really? listen, it's three lines, is it? it's, a, it's an, epic, an epic song. On the subject of football songs that aren't football songs, the thing I love about Sweet Caroline is, um, like, I never knew that that song was so relaxed. Because mm. every time you hear it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, when you listen it to it, like it's that. just sweet. <laughs> it's a good point, <laughs> that isn't it? But it's so we've amped made up. it. And when I but, first heard but, it, I was like, I was like, oh, is this like a live version that he does? That's like a bit more relaxed. But yeah, no, we've made that's it. The like... song. <laughs> it's uh, it, that song goes really well with uh, a football game. Yeah, I think <laughs> football football songs just have the ability to be really cheesy as well. Like, what was the one? There's been some some shockers. Oh, some there's been, real more, there's been shockers. more 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 bad than good. I'll be quite honest. Yeah. That's why I don't really I don't that nineties era. I don't know. It was well, a good because era from... do you know why? Because they wrote three lines is a song. Like it is a you play it on the guitar and it is a song. Mm. Whereas some of the songs that have been recently are like either like I remember. Do you remember the song from Paris to Berlin? And mm. they did from. Was it from England to Berlin and every time that... No, for, yeah, from Paris to Berlin and every time that England win, we're going to win the World Cup. Do you remember mm. that? But no, it was just like a play on another song and I yeah. feel like the... You need a proper the, song. Yeah, the Dizzy and James Corden one, that was a play on another song. Uh, Ant and Deck was a play on another song, I mm. think. But I think like you write... write three lines being an original written on guitar or piano or how, however it's written. Like Sweet Caroline is also just a song. So I think yeah, that's the way that's, to... That's the way to go. Yeah, that works. But yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, it has been discussed. We've discussed it lots, lot, lots of times. But also, like making who, who a song... asks you? Who asks you? Like the FA? Uh, no, or... I think there was a conversation. I think it, I think I've been asked to do the rugby one before. The cricket. I got, I've, been, I've definitely been asked to do a oh. few. It's like a, it's like a Bond song. It's like you've got to eventually. As a as an English singer, like want to do a Bond song, have like you, I think you haven't done a Bond song, yet, have you? I was within a fucking gnat's pube of doing really? one, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the they changed directors, and then they just changed scripts, and that was really? it. But we done all the meetings. I started writing it, and it was. Is that on your radar then? That's something you'd like to do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend it didn't hurt not mm. doing it. But yeah, I would if they came back. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Do you know any other sort of musicians, pop stars that play football? Ollie Mose, he's yeah, a good play, footballer. I, he's good. Yeah, I'll he's a good footballer. Uh, the lads from Rizzle Kicks are really good. Oh no. Um, yeah. Who else? We had Rudimental on tour with us for like a year and used to do like a regular game with them and they were all really good. Kezi, Kezi from Rudimental was like top. Yeah, Who do you think is a good footballer that's pop star? Um, Serge is good. Kasabian. I never would do any of those games though because I feel like the... Um, the aim of the game would be to break my legs. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Why? Okay, so I've been named number 17 of the Ipswich squad as a, like, thank you for sponsoring it. And, like, they've been... In, you know, like my mates, like, oh, if they if they get promoted, like, way before the season ends, would you do a game? And I'm like, not really, because if you're playing Fleetwood, mm -hmm. the first... The, there's going to be someone on the pitch on Fleetwood being like, I'm breaking Ed Sheeran's <laughs> legs. <laughs> That definitely they were, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You've got a target on your back, isn't it? Absolutely. It's like, it's like Chris Stark. Um, Chris Stark, obviously, now uh, from being on the podcast, talks about his five side games. I've ripped him for wearing shin pads. He's talking about pancakes, and he's taking the shin pads off because I ripped him for it. And uh, he's now a real target without uh, the shin pads. Because yeah, he, he's, he's showing me bruises every, and I feel bad now. It is a mate. It is. A, it's a. It's a very like friendly, unfriendly sport, isn't it? Because well, yeah, you can... I mean, if you're playing, I think there will be people out there that will want to either you know embarrass you, nutmeg you, or foul you. Um, yeah, that's I'm, unfortunately I'm, just how people. I'm perfectly happy not to. I'm just like all sport. All sport. I, do, I, I played a, a a charity cricket game the other day. Like played played it, and they asked me to do that as well. But I'm just not like sport. Just I love doing it. In, I don't want people watching me doing yeah, it. Yeah, I love doing yeah, it in, yeah. for fun with my my mates. Yeah. But yeah, I was never that good at school, and mm. and it definitely and it. I think the thing is, it takes you back to school where you're not the cool kid because you're not good at sport. And I, you know, I've worked so hard to be the cool kid, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're doing very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, listen, Ed, you've got a, a big show to do, so I'll let you go. Thank but you. But I really appreciate you doing nice this, mate. Thing, man. I really love it. And let's do Crouch the Fest. pub. Pub quiz at yours would be, be awesome, mate. 